Joining me right now is the voice, Michael Chavello. He is the one championship commentator and one of the most familiar voices in MMA around the world. Thank you for joining me. Welcome to Kumite Radio. John, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to finally be talking to you. For sure. Um, first of all, I want to talk about, you know, how did this whole one championship Michael Chavello thing come together? Uh, well, uh, I was working over in the U.S. for Access TV, uh, based out of Las Vegas for the last seven years, and uh, the executive producer of, of, of One Championship is a guy called Bo Vongsakun, and Bo used to be one of the EPs at Access TV, so I'd known Bo uh, for several years. We worked together before he left Access to join One Championship. And over the last few years, Bo had often called me up and said, hey, Voice, when you get a chance, we'd love to have you at one to commentate uh, you know, some of our shows. But I never got the chance because I was, I was so busy commentating everything in the US. And uh, then earlier this year, as my, uh, my, my contract with Access was coming to an end, uh, it was just fortuitous that Bo gave me a call and said, hey, mate, um, you know, are, are you ready to come and work for one championship? We'd love to have you. And I said, mate, I'm... I, I would absolutely love the opportunity to to join the you know, biggest martial arts organization in the world and put my voice on that and to work with you again and work with a, a, a stellar outfit that I think are doing the right thing by martial arts and are expanding uh, so rapidly across Asia. And uh, so as soon as they offered me a, a contract to join them, uh, I signed up and hopped on board and haven't looked back since and I'm enjoying every moment of it. You made your debut, you know, last year during the summer. When you started... What did you see different about One Championship compared to all the other shows that you've done? I think the difference with One Championship was the, uh, um, the ideals behind it and the mindset, the psychology behind it and, and, and the message they're trying to push and the sort of the, 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 um, uh, the breed of combat sports or martial arts that they're trying to push. That really, for me, stands them apart from... Any other promotion I've worked for, and I've worked around the world, as you know, for you know uh, the biggest fight promotions out of the US and doing K1 and Sengoku and Dream and Dynamite and The Contender, etc. But the thing about One Championship is their ideals are so pure with their, the way they want to push uh, martial arts, you know, pure martial arts sport and certainly not the, the blood sport violent side, of, of which, which is more akin to the UFC. You know, with One Championship, it's not mixed martial arts, it's martial arts. It's Asia's greatest cultural treasure. And MMA is just one of several martial arts that one championship is trying to push throughout Asia and then, of course, to the rest of the world. You know, there's karate, kickboxing, kung fu, uh, letwe, muay thai, uh, capoeira, mixed martial arts, judo, wrestling, jiu-jitsu. So MMA is just one sort of martial art that they are pushing in a whole umbrella of martial arts and the way that they approach that, the way they respect martial arts, the way they promote martial arts, their storytelling abilities, and also the fact that they, they are just so bloody good at their jobs, you know. One Championship travels with an enormous crew to every single show, uh, which is different to anywhere else I've worked. Usually in the US, we'd have a skeleton crew going from show to show each week in a different city, and we'd hire or, or, or recruit uh, floor crew, sound crew, camera crew, ring girls, MC, etc. depending on the area we're in. Well, one championship, being a behemoth that it is, travels with all of these people to every show. So everybody knows their different department and it's a well-oiled machine. So I think just the, 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 the bigness of it and their approach to martial arts is really what attracted me to it and was, was the major difference to what I've been working with in the past. Commentating in Asia, what are some of the challenges that you face, though? Um, you know, I was used to the challenges from back in my early K1 days. You know, I started doing K1 internationally in 2001. So I've been commentating around Asia for a while. I think some of the differences are um, when it comes to, to global rule set, you know, martial arts in a cage, is that A, the Asian audience is not as educated as the US audience. Uh, that said, though, their passion is unbelievable. But you've got to be careful because they're not as educated. It's not getting too technical. Don't get weighed down with the technical stuff. Why call an omoplata an omoplata when you can call it a shoulder lock and let people know what's actually happening? You know, instead of calling it a goggle plata, you know, use phrases like, well, he's putting the shin 
across the throat, pulling the head down, and that's how you affect the choke. So I think it's simplifying the techniques into a layman's language that everyone can understand rather than getting overly technical uh, was one of the, I guess you could say, challenges, but something that was actually a pleasure to do. And also I think the, uh, the, the sensitivities, John, with different countries you visit throughout Asia, even though we reference Asia as one, you know, uh, the, 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 the political and cultural sensitivities, let's say in Myanmar, are completely different than they are in Malaysia which are completely different than they are in the Philippines, different than they are in China. So everywhere I go and everywhere we go, we've got to be aware of the local sensitivities and make sure that while we're having fun and we're, 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 you know, we're energised and we're, we're, we're passionate about the projects and the, you know, the shows which we are, we're also not stepping on any toes, so to speak, because we don't want to offend anyone. Um, I think that's also one of the challenges throughout Asia. But... Uh, the fact that the sport is so raw there still, and I think the fact that you can still do martial art versus martial art, whereas in the US, you can't do that anymore. It used to be great in the early days of the UFC. I used to love seeing, like, this is kung fu versus karate. This is wrestling versus capoeira. You know, this is sumo versus BJJ. You can't do that anymore in the US because everyone these days is a hybrid martial artist. Mm -hmm. You ask them what martial arts style they are, and they're like, well, I do wrestling with jiu-jitsu, and I do some Muay Thai and striking, and then I dabble a little bit in, you know, some kung fu trapping hands, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas with one championship, I'd say 90, man, 98% of our guys are still, well, I'm wushu, mm -hmm. I'm kung fu, I'm jiu-jitsu, I'm wrestling, I'm judo, I'm karate. They're like one major martial art. And I love that because this whole sport, was originally based on that concept, which martial art is better. So when we see, you know, a matchup like uh, 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 someone like a, a Martin Nguyen versus a Bibiano Fernandez, you know, we're going to see two contrasting styles and we can build it up as two contrasting styles and see which one of those styles wins out in the end, you know. Or if you see some, something like, uh, you know, Alan Galani, uh, versus Hideki Sakine, and you see uh, a, a pure judo guy against the guy who's done a lot more uh, kyokushin and, and kickboxing, then you get that ground versus stand-up pure styles. And I love that about Adrian. It's still so raw and so, so entertaining. Speaking of uh, Nguyen and Fernandez, uh, the last event won Iron Will. Nguyen went for his third title. He was not successful. Did you, when you were cage side, when you were watching this, did you, what did you think of what played out in that fight? You know what? It was, A, it was one of the most entertaining main events I've seen. Though there was no knockout and neither man got close to a submission finish and uh, both of them tagged each other but not heavy enough to, 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 to render anyone unconscious. It was so entertaining because here you had two fabulous martial artists at the peak of their powers and, and he had this, 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 Old lion at the top of the mountain, Bibiano Fernandez, who was like at an eight-win streak in one championship, untouchable, had obliterated uh, Andrew Leone and Macau in August of last year, you know, in a matter of seconds. And here you have the young, hungry, I mean, a banterweight, literally hungry, Martin Nguyen coming up the mountain, wanting to make history, wanting to be the first one ever to get three, three belts in three different divisions in the history of the sport. So this was... A, 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 a beautiful storyline, a battle of strategies, and it was the big questions. Could Martin Nguyen stand up to the sheer skill set and volume of Fernandez, who was the most talented martial artist he's competed against yet? Let's face it. Falayang, Gafarov, brilliant martial artist, but Bibiano's on another level. And could Bibiano Fernandez work out what no one else has worked out, how to avoid and counter that overhand right of Martin? So you had this cat and mouse game for five rounds solo that was real back and forth action. And when I went to a decision, I, you know, initially I thought, to be very honest, John, I thought Martin had edged it. Mm. I thought Bibiano had a brilliant fifth and final round, his best round of the contest. But I thought for four rounds before that, on the criteria we score on in one championship, I thought Martin had won. I thought he did more damage. I thought he did more effective striking. He had takedown defense. Martin could, uh, Bibiano couldn't keep him down. Okay, so I thought that maybe Martin had edged it. Um, the result, though, you know, it's hard to argue. It was so close. It was uh, razor thin. Uh, really, 
in my opinion, it deserves a rematch. It really does. Because I think Bibiano was given one of the toughest tests of his career, and so too was Martin. And talking to, to both camps the day after, um, especially to Martin's camp, I, I, I could sense they, they wanted a rematch somewhere down the line, and they knew just how close it was. And it, it could have gone either way. Do you think that the rematch is a high possibility? You know what? I, I do. Um, I think it's going to depend on Bibiano and where Bibiano is at. Uh, Bibiano wanted a real challenge. That was the thing. I had breakfast with him a couple of days before the event. He said to me, voice, I, I, I need to be challenged. I need a really good, hard, tough opponent to show me where I'm at in the pecking order of the martial arts world, to show me whether I've still got it or not, whether I'm the flesh, whether I am truly the greatest, the best at the moment. I need to know that. Or am I in the twilight of my career? Have I lost some of my starch? Have I lost some of my speed? And Martin Ewing gave him that test. So, and you know, Bibiano I heard went to hospital afterwards, he got some stitches, he was okay, but he had a little bit of damage. So I guess the ball's probably going to be in Bibiano's court as to whether he'd take a rematch immediately with Martin or whether he'd try to get some other scalps and then maybe look at Martin uh, later this year or, or next year. You know, depending how busy Bibiato wants to stay, he's in his late 30s now, and, you know, he may be in the twilight of his career. Still looks phenomenal with me, but I think that that ball's probably in Bibiano's court. Um, but I think a rematch would, would, would be amazing. And I, I think it would go down completely different to what we saw. I, I honestly think a rematch doesn't last the distance. I can't say in whose favour it would be, but now that both athletes have seen what each other has, um, I think both probably have figured out how they could finish one another. Yeah, I definitely agree. Uh, yeah, the rematch has to happen, and it will not go the distance. These guys are the best of the best, and they're going to figure out a way to finish this fight. I don't know who's going to win, but it's going to be exciting. Now, looking into the future, uh, April 20th in Manila, uh, one Super Series launches. What makes this exciting for you? Man, this is, for me, is one of the most exciting developments in the martial arts world in, in, in recent years. This is, this is one championship moving into striking competition, pure striking competition. And like the old K1 days, inviting martial arts, martial artists from every striking style to join them under one um, umbrella. I mean, we're opening up one super series to Muay Thai, to Lethway, to Karate, Taekwondo, Kickboxing, all you know, boxing, all the major striking arts can come and compete, but it's not going to be limited to one rule set either. And I like that. We're going to have a mixture of uh, a kickboxing rules. We're going to have Muay Thai rules. We're going to have Muay Thai in a cage. You know, Muay Thai in a cage with four ounce gloves. Muay Thai in a cage with with regular boxing gloves. You know, uh, Muay Thai in a ring. It, it, it just opens it up to every sort of striking contest. And the talent that one Super Series is signing is off the chart. I mean, you're talking about the best of the best. They've signed Giorgio Petrosian, probably the best kickboxer of the last 15 years. They've signed Yodson Clay Fairtex, you know, one of the top two or three Muay Thai stylists of the, uh, of the last 10 years. Uh, they've signed Pech Bunchu, maybe the greatest Muay Thai uh, combatant of all time. You know, they've signed Nongo, Sam A. Gangadau, Fabio Pinka, uh, Smokin' Joe Nutterwa, Brad Riddell, uh, Sergio Veltson, the list goes on and on. Uh, Steve McKinnon, these are all world-class strikers who have agreed to throw down in, in one Super Series. And to kick it off with a two-time K1 Max champion, Giorgio Petrosian, taking on a two-time line fight champion and a WMC world champion, Smokin' Joe Nutterwatt, I mean, that's insane. The, the level of the caliber of opponents there is just nuts. I commentated Petrosian a glory in K1 Max twice, and I commentated uh, Smoker Joe Nadawa to glory in, in Lion Fight. And to me, John, this is like a, a Lamborghini colliding with a monster truck. It is going to be something exceptional. So one Super Series, I think, is going to bring a whole new audience uh, that is not maybe watching the global rule set in the cage, but they like watching striking. They like the immediate action, the shorter distance, you know, three three-minute rounds on the kickboxing stuff for the striking. And, um, you know, with that new audience comes new eyes on one championship as a whole and a chance to expand even more. I, I think this is just 
something phenomenal by by Victor and, and Chuck Tree and Matt Hume and all the team there at one at one championship. Michael, you've been commentating for years and years for a myriad of uh, promotions all around the world. If you look back right now, what is the best fight, competitively the best fight that you've watched cage side? Man, you know, John, I've, I've been commentating combat sports since, you ask a hard question there, my friend, since 1995 or 96, I think it was. So we're talking 21, 22 years. And I must have commentated over 7,000 fights in 24 different countries. So to choose just one is hard. I can maybe, I'll maybe give you a couple that stand out. Um, 2007, I think it was, at the Budokan Arena, a very famous arena in Tokyo where the Beatles played, of course, and where uh, Muhammad Ali infamously fought um, um, Antonio Inoki. Uh, Masato fought Bulacau in K1 Max. And I remember commentating that with Ray Seffo and the late Mike Bernardo. And that was one of my favorite fights of all time. And you can find it on YouTube with our English commentary. That was a back and forth content with, with, contest with some of the greatest kickboxing technique you will ever see and a nutty crowd. So Bulacau versus Masato 2007 at the Budokan. Uh, but I guess the one that, you know what, so we'll go back a bit further, 2001 in Fukuoka. Uh, Mark Hunt versus Ray Seffo, arguably the greatest K1 fight heavyweight of all time, where you see two big Polynesians drop their hands and invite the other to swing to their jaw and try and knock each other out. And that was Mark and Ray at the peak of their powers. You know, that was phenomenal. Um, but I guess that's going to be Seoul, Korea, and a, 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 a fight that's gone viral on YouTube uh, is Chahid versus Mike Zambides. Um, Man, I lost the plot in that fight. And you can hear it on the commentary. And to this day, it's regarded as maybe the best kickboxing fight of all time. Certainly with probably the most electrifying action of any kickboxing match ever. Uh, that one will always stand out. Uh, we lost our voices commentating it. It was me and Mike Kogan and Ray Seffo in, in Seoul. But people, if you, if you haven't seen that, uh, Chahid versus Zambides, do yourself a favour. You know, Book yourself 12 minutes, sit back and just be entertained by one of the greatest scraps you'll, you'll ever see. All right, Michael, thank you for your time. And uh, we'll definitely be listening to you at every one championship event. John, it's been a pleasure, mate. Thank you so very much for having me on the show and uh, we'll catch everyone. And Manila, April 20, going to be there. Thanks, John.